And so these guys would go to the field and get that grain and um, provide for their families. Now, Ruth is a Moabite, okay? She's a Moabite that said to Naomi, my God will be your God, your people will be my people. And immediately, she's already following the law of God. And so when she follows God's law, she gets blessed. Not only does she get um, a lot of grain for Naomi, but she ends up getting a husband, right? And then finally, the last one that you wanted to see is the law of the kinsman redeemer, the Levite. Remember that one weird law that if the brother, um, if, the, if the brother dies before giving a child to his wife, then the other brother needs to marry that wife, right? And you're like, man, that's a weird law. Why did you, why did you do that for? Well, the first one was practical because when God gives a promised land to his people, he gives it also to the families within that tribe. And when God gives you something, he never breaks his promise. He never breaks his promise. So what's going to happen here is that what if a situation hap well, what if a situation happens where the wife loses her husband, but she marries another person, but, she, but he's from a different tribe. So all these property boundaries are going to start switching. And God doesn't like that because he gave that to a specific family member. And so the law of the, uh, the, law of the, the kinsman redeemer, the goel, or the Levirate marriage, was to make sure that when God gave a promise to someone, it always stayed there. So that's one practical reason. And, and that's what Ruth is going to do to Boaz. She's going to claim her, him as the kinsman redeemer. But why, but why is this a big deal? Because I told you guys that when you read the book of Ruth, it's supposed to help you understand why Jesus had to be a man, right? It's supposed to help you why Jesus had to be a man. Well, it's the same concept spiritually, right? It's the same concept spiritually. When Jesus, when God created the heavens and the earth, he gave us the earth as our promised land. I want you to see that. He gave us the earth as our promised land. But we forfeited it when, we, when Adam and Eve ate of the knowledge of good and evil. And so now this world belongs to Satan. So how, do, how does God redeem this world? How does he take this property and put it back to the person that he promised it to? Well, that's why Jesus had to be a man. Because only a man, because since he promised that to a man, only a man can redeem that. And so that's where we get the kinsman redeemer from. That's where we get the concept of the Goel. The book of Ruth shows you in a very picturistic way why Jesus had to be a man to save us, because he had to redeem the world for us. And so I gave you this truth rhyme, so just go ahead and repeat after me. In the book of Ruth, I understand. Why Jesus had to be a man. And so what you'll see here is, is Ruth is almost like a picture of the church. She's a Gentile church, right? And both. And you'll see that when you go into 1 Kings, 1 uh, and 2 Kings, and 1 and 2 Chronicles. All those sections, 1 and 2 Samuel to that section, talk about the transition of leadership of kings, okay? And so um, I give you this theme, and then a lot of you guys are going to be like, all right, that's a nice theme, but how, what's that have to do with my daily life? I mean, it's kind of nice to know that the Bible says it's about judges and kings, but how am I supposed to apply that to my life? Right? Well, the thing is, and this is what I want you to understand. When you see these kings, you'll see a lot of bad kings and good kings. Some of these kings you haven't even, you're not even going to want to vote for, and they're up there, right? And so I want you to understand that when you look at the book of Kings, in, I mean, book of Samuel as a whole, you realize that God is in control all the time. That no matter what, regardless of who is um, sitting on the throne, God is ultimately on the throne so that you don't have to fret. You don't have to be worried anymore, right? And so that's the general idea that you want to apply. 
And sometimes, and I don't know what it is, but sometimes we forget that God is on the throne and we try to do things on our own strength. But God is showing us that it's not about that, that God is always in control. So that's a general theme. Um, so anyway, uh, what did I do here? Now I'm going to go to um, share with you what we'll be talking about today. And we're going to be um, talking about chapters, 1 Samuel chapters 1 through 7. Chapters 1 through 7. And so the title of that sermon is Holy Wrath and Repentance. Holy Wrath and Repentance. What you're going to see is God judging Israel for their sin. And you're also going to see he's going to be judging Gentiles, particularly the Philistines, for their sin. That's all you're seeing. Um, the, and the beautiful thing that, about this section is that it begins with Hannah's prayer of having a, a judge that would help lead people back to God. And then finally, you end with her son's prayer in leading Israel back to repentance. And so it's a very, it's almost like a, it, it dovetails today because we're doing every seven chapters each week, right? So it kind of just like keeps everything together nicely. So anyway, um, I want you to understand that when you see God judging Israel and judging uh, the Philistines, it's actually a picture of, of what you guys read in the New Testament in Romans chapters 3 through 9. Let me go ahead and show it with, share it with you. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. And that's what you see in the book of Samuel. When you see God judging, um, you might know these names, I think, Juliet, um, Hockney and Finus, right? When you start seeing God judging them when they bring the ark back, you'll see that God is no respecter of nation. That when he is, when there is sin, he will judge them for their sin. But then you'll also see some really interesting concepts, such as how in the world did the Philistines touch the ark and put it on Dagon, right? How in the world did that happen? You guys know what I'm talking about because you know we're not supposed to be touching that. So how did they do it? And so we're going to be able to, you know, go over some of these things because we see that our God is very gracious and, he, and he's trying to give people a lot of chances to repent. But no matter how many signs he shows them, they don't. And it's only those people who generally want to repent that will actually come to God. So you'll see those things. Um, so at the end, um, I, I talked about holy wrath. At the end, you will see repentance because finally Israel repents and they start experiencing victory in their lives, right? Um, so when they repent and, and start taking away their other gods, when the Philistines go at war with them, they start to win. So times of refreshing came. And that's exactly what Peter was preaching when it came to the gospel. He said in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So I want you to see that when you go through the book of Samuel, a lot of the things that you learn in the New Testament are almost like in story form in the Old Testament, okay? That when we come into repentance, uh, when, we, when we repent to God, then good things start to happen. And that's exactly what we see with Israel. So anyway, just to tie everything together, um, here's your truth, Brian, for today. Just go ahead and repeat after me. When we sin, his wrath is sent. God's love begins when we repent. Okay, so let's go ahead. I'm not going to give you an outline today. It seems like it works better this way when you get into story form. Besides, it's in an area. So I'm going to go into story form and just follow along with me as we um, follow that concept of holy wrath and repentance. All right? Let's begin. First Samuel 1 Samuel 1.1. Now, there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah the son of Jehoram, the son of Elihu, the son of Toha, the son of Zuth, and Ephraimite. So you read all that stuff, and because we're not of Hebrew, we're not uh, of that Hebrew culture, we don't know what these genealogies mean. But basically, what this text is saying is that Elkanah comes from the tribe of Levi. Elkanah comes from the tribe of Levi. How do I know? Because the Bible says so. It says, and these are the ones who ministered with their sons. It's 1 Chronicles 6, 33-34. Of the sons of the Kohathites were the Heman, the singer, the son of Joel, the son of Samuel, the son of Elkanah, which is what we read, the son of Jehoram, the son of Ilya, and the son of Toa. And so you're like, okay, pastor, I see where you're reading this from, but I still don't see how he's from the tribe of Levi. 
So this is why you guys are reading the book of Numbers. This is why you're reading all these genealogies. Because when you start to get into details like this, you'll get blown away. Be like, yo, that guy's a Levite, right? It says here in Numbers 2657, and these are those who are numbered of the Levites, according to their families of Gershon, the family of the Gershonites, of Kohath. That's what we just read. Samuel comes from Kohath, from the line of Kohath, the family of the Kohathites of Merari, and the family of the Merarites. So Samuel comes from the tribe of Levi, right? And so basically what they're telling us is that Elkanah, Hannah, his family, they come from good stock. But remember, as we go into 1 Samuel, they're still in the period of the book of Judges. And what do they do in the book of Judges? Everyone was doing right in their own eyes, right? And because they're doing the right in their own eyes, well, it looks like that this guy Elkanah, who supposedly a Levite does right in his own eyes too. Let me show you what he did. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And see, this is what I mean when they were doing right in their own eyes. And you would think that a Levite who had the first five books of the Bible, who would have learned from the stories of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, who would have learned from the story of, uh, of Jacob, uh, Leah and Rachel, you would have thought that he would have learned their lesson and say, hey man, this is a bad idea to have two wives because it was a problem back then. But you know what? This is what happens when you drift away from God's word. They did what was right in their own eyes and this, was a, and this, was, this caused problems. You know, we already saw that there was problems with Rachel and Leah and this guy's now doing it on himself. And so I want you to understand that Israel was still in a bad place, that they were still doing what was right in their own eyes. And so, so you understand that it's not right. Well, let me put it this way. When God designed the family, he only created Adam, and then after that he created Eve. And it's always been like that. And then we, res and we see this repeated um, theme when we go into Timothy, where he says if anyone wants to be a pastor or where everyone wants to be an administrator, they must be a husband of one wife, right? Even when we look at Jesus Christ, he only has one wife, which is the church, and so, while it does not say specifically that it's a sin to have two wives, we know that that's not the original design. It has never been the original design. So anyway, we see problems about this situation because, um, and her rival, which is Hannah's rival, also provoked Hannah severely to make her miserable, miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So Peninnah, she kept on um, making fun of, she kept on like, just berating, berating um, Hannah for not having children. And you have to understand, with Hebrew women, when they, when they grow up in that culture, they feel that their purpose is to bear children, right? So with an, when a Hebrew woman cannot bear a child, right, um, it's almost like, like a death sentence to them. It almost makes them feel like they're less of a woman. And so I could imagine what Peninnah was doing. And the scriptures say that she severely provoked her, right? So that pretty much means that she wanted her to die from depression like she was really dogging her, really dogging her. And so look at this. And so it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Did you know that her husband, Hannah's husband, was so gracious to her that she would give her a double portion each time when they go up year by year? But you know what? Peninnah was not going to have any of that. She did not even want her to enjoy that consolation. And so she would make her miserable go about it so that she would even enjoy the blessing. I mean, imagine that, you know, like, you know, um, your husband loves you so much that he cooks you like a whole tray of pots to you. And then Peninnah starts dogging you so much that you can't even eat a bite, you know, and that's sad. And so that's what, she, that's what Peninnah would do, and this is why marriage should only be between a man and a woman, not a man and two women, right? Man and two women. But here's a detail that I want to share with you. It's very important. I want to share with you. Verse 6, And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable, miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. Hey, it was, has nothing to do with what Hannah was, uh, was doing. God purposely closed it. He closed it, and he knew that she was going to be harassed. And you're scratching your head thinking, why is God allowing this to happen? Well, 
I, all I can tell you is the same reason why he closed Sarah's womb. It's the same reason why he closed Rebecca's womb. And it's the same reason why he closed Rachel's womb. God does that because he wants us to call out to him for our need. And he's actually preparing that person for a special purpose. But we have to call on God. We have to call on God. We can't rely on our ability to take, to take care of our needs. We have to call on him. And so that's exactly <clears throat> what, uh, what uh, Hannah would do. But this is the first thing that I want you to understand. That when we see things in life, like say, for example, and I don't know if you, you're going through this, but have you ever wondered, like, for some reason, like, you have this nice plan uh, to do well for your family, and then all of a sudden it just, it just never pans out for some reason? Like, it always feels like you're always getting knocked down? Or have you ever, like, realized that, um, have you ever felt like, you know, you're, you're doing your best at your job, but for some reason you're not progressing, and you feel like it's your fault? But when you think about it, God is always in control. He promotes people and then he demotes people. So what in the world is going on? Well, God does that so that he can be glorified in those things. And we just got to wait on it. Here, let me show you what happened. So remember that Hannah's womb was closed? Well, in the book of John, look, at, look, look, look what we see here. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor this parent's sin, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So in other words, God purposely made that guy blind. He did that. He did that so that when the time came, and this guy has no clue what's going on, that he would glorify himself. Did you know that this principle that you're seeing here is the same principle that you see in the book of Job? Same principle. Who made Job poor? I know that he allowed Satan to do it, but he gave him permission to do it. Who took away his family, right? But you see at the end that it was all used for Job to glorify God. And then in the end, Job received double portion of what he experienced in his life. And so I tell you, Faith Baptist Fellowship, I don't ever want you looking at what's happening to you and saying, man, you know, God doesn't love me because this is why this is happening. He is allowing things for a purpose so that you would call upon him that you would call upon him so that he would fulfill that need so that he can glorify himself. And so let me go show you how, how Hannah uh, approached her need. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. So for you Bible geeks that are out there, you notice that this is very similar to Samson's uh, Samson situation, right? Did you know that Samson's mom was also barren too, right? And then Hannah was also barren too? Like there seems to be like a, an ongoing literary device that when you're barren, that doesn't mean bad news. It's actually means the best news you'll ever get, right? But in any case, I'll leave that for you guys to go and study further. I want to go straight to the point. You'll notice that when Hannah prays, she doesn't pray, God, why did you close my womb? You see what this woman is doing? You know, and you knew she was going to do it, so why did you close my womb? She didn't do that. As a matter of fact, she went and said, Lord, you see how much I'm suffering. Have mercy on me. Lord God, please, you know, give me a child. And if you give me a male child, then I will give him to you. Now, this is what I want you to understand. When Hannah prayed that prayer, that prayer was according to God's will. Do you understand what I'm saying? That prayer was according to God's will. And I'm not saying that, okay, the principle is, if you want to get something from God, you got to make a bargain with him, right? First, you'd say, God, if, if, if you do this for me, then I'll do this for you. That's not going to work. It doesn't work like that. The idea is that when you suffer so much and you pray for that need, the need that you pray for is not only just going to be for you. That need is going to fulfill God's kingdom. It's going to be according to his will. God wanted Israel to repent. You already see from this guy, from this Levite guy, that he's already doing what's right in his own eyes, right? And so now he wants the people to repent. And so here, Hannah is praying this prayer for the child to be used by God for whatever he wants to do. And God answered that prayer because he wanted to use that child to, to cause Israel to come back to him. And so you'll see a, very, a strong similarity in the Lord's prayer. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The prayer, okay, the prayer is not about God, I'll make this deal with you if you do this for me. That's not what, it, what is mentioned in Jephthah, okay? Jephthah did that, but that was weird, all right? The idea is that he makes this prayer so that God's will would be done, so that Israel would be victorious over his enemies. He shouldn't have made that vow, but the idea was, you know, it has to be according to God's will, all right? And so Faith Baptist Fellowship, um, I know we're small. I know sometimes we struggle, right? But I tell you the truth, um, there are, there's, there's a purpose for that. And all we need to do is to come together and not complain about what's going on with us, but complain about how much we're suffering and allow God to use this church so that we can be big and help other people out. He's trying to get us to say, Lord, okay, I, I give up. You know, I'm tired of suffering. I'm going to do your will now. Whatever it is that you want me to do, God, I'm ready to do your will. That's basically what he's trying to do. All right, so he allows suffering. Now, there's other people that don't belong to him. You know what he does? He doesn't let them suffer. And so they get plugged into what I call a matrix, right? They get plugged into this fantasy that they have no problems and they have no need for God. Man, that's a curse, man. That's a huge curse. So what does God say to us in the Beatitudes? Blessed are those who are poor, <laughs> but theirs is the kingdom of God because the poor people are going to seek God. They're going to cry out to him, and then God's going to fulfill their need. And you're going to realize that he's going to give more than what you need. He's going to go beyond what you even expect because he gives you eternity instead of what you're really wanting to have. So be blessed, Faith Baptist Fellowship. The reason why we struggle, the reason why we have pain, is because we're blessed. I know that sounds weird, but you're going to get it, okay? As you go through this life, you're going to understand that the reason why we struggle is because we're blessed. Anyway. Let's continue on. Um, so God answers his prayer. Then they rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah, Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. And I like that. Because Hannah wanted to remember the blessing that God gave her. And so she would name him according to that. Samuel means asked of the Lord. And so anyway, um, uh, you see that Hannah is dedicating Samuel to his will. And now we're going to go into how Hannah praises the Lord. And she's going to say a lot of interesting things in that prayer in chapter 2. So let me go ahead and share that with you. It says here in Samuel 2, 6 through 7, The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts them up. Now, I want you to understand the context of why she's saying all that. She realizes that it was the Lord that made her barren, and it is the Lord that makes them fertile. And so she kind of just says it and says, yeah, man, the Lord kills and makes alive. The Lord does this. He is all in control. And so she's realizing that all this time as she was suffering, that it was part of God's plan and that he was in control and that at that moment in time, he was going to give her a child. It was almost like she remembered that Sarah was barren for so many years, up to 90 years old. And then all of a sudden, God blessed them with a miracle and they had a child. And so now she's understanding the general theme that God is always in control. He's always in control. And, and, and what we need to realize and what we need to control ourselves in is that to, we need to remember that. Because a lot of times when we're in pain, we feel like, oh, no, something bad is happening. But actually something good is happening. Anyway, and so we realize that regardless of what men can do, they can do nothing. Because God's will always trumps over man's will. God's will always trumps over man's will. And you see that when she continues in this prayer. He will guard the feet of his saints. Hey, check that out. That, that includes Hannah. She guarded the feet of her, you know, guarded her. But the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by the strength of no man, but for by strength no man shall prevail. In other words, man's will can never trump over God's will. And so I want you to understand this powerful principle because it's related to how you believe to be a Christian. In other words, it's not by your ability that you're saved. It's because of what God did for you that you're saved. 
right? It's because of Jesus Christ. It's not because of your ability that you stay sanctified and obey. It's because the Holy Spirit that lives in you causes you to love God, and that's why you stay sanctified, and that's why you obey. And the reason why you succeed in life isn't because you're so smart or you're so gifted or even when you're hardworking. It's because God grants you success and gives you all these things so that you can be successful. So it's all God, and everything brings God the glory. No strength of no man shall prevail. It's always God's strength that prevails. Now, I've taken you to a good place, right? I've taken you to a good place. Remember, it started off kind of bad. Peninnah was messing her up, right? And then now it came back up that Hannah was good. Well, you're going to see that there's going to be a roller coaster that's happening in the book of Sam. Because just as you know that Hannah was at a good place and dedicated this child for the Lord, you're going to find out that the priesthood was in, a, it was in horrible shape. We're talking about the sons of Aaron. They're in bad shape. It says here, now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. Okay, this is very strong language. I want you to, if you, if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to this passage here. But you'll see a footnote there, and you know what it says? It's not just corrupt. It called the sons of Eli sons of Belial, or in other words, sons of the devil. That's how the language in Hebrew says. It says, now the sons of Eli were sons of the devil. They did not know the Lord. And so you're scratching your head and you're saying, hey man, these guys are from the tribe of Aaron. Are, are you saying that, you know, that devil children come out of that tribe? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They do. Okay, they do. How do I know that? Because in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, it says this, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. You understand that principle? So just because you are born in a Christian home doesn't mean you're saved. Just because you come to a church and you think that you're doing all the right things does not mean you are saved. The Lord has to know you. You have to be born again, and you have to know the Lord. And one of the signs of a person that's not saved is that they do not know the Lord. Right? That's the thing. Remember, in like, in the book, I think it's, yeah, it's in, it's in the Beatitudes. Remember how Jesus said, uh, remember how the prophet said, Lord, um, didn't we not cast demons in your name? Did we not uh, cast miracles in your name? And then Jesus says, depart from me, for I never knew you. You see, it has nothing to do with what we do. It has everything to do with what God does in us. Right? And so these, these guys, although they were serving under the lineage of Aaron as priests, they were doing weird things, horrible things. And I, I and here, like, I'm, this is my backup to tell you that I know that Eli's sons were not saved because they did not know the Lord. You, you're talking about a priest, guys, born in a good priesthood. It's I don't know how else to put this. This is no offense to to all the the pastor kids, uh, the pastor kids, right? Just because you, you're born in a pastor kid family doesn't mean the pastor kid's saved, right? That's basically what we're learning here. And it wasn't just that they acted corruptly, right? You know, they give us more details of what they did. Let me go ahead and read that to you. And also before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who sacrificed, give meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you, but raw. In other words, hey, don't, don't burn off the fat of my meat because I like the fat, right? And, and if the man said to them, they should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires, he would then answer him, no, but you must give it now. If not, I will take it by force. And so back in those days, the, the church was almost like a business, okay? All they were doing was getting the best of everything, right? They would do even more weird things. I'll even show you some more stuff. Yeah, I'll show you some more stuff, but I'm just talking about the offerings. Their example was so bad that people didn't want to give offerings to the Lord anymore because they said, you know what? I, I know what they're going to do. They're just going to go ahead and just get, like, prime rib out of that thing. So why do I have to give that to them? You know, they don't even honor God in that. So that's what they were thinking. It says here in Scripture, Therefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men aboard the offering of the Lord, or in other words... These people had a bad view of God now. There, there was no point in coming to God. And so, and so now you understand why the people of Israel 
were doing what's right in their own eyes. Because even at the priesthood, at that level, they were doing what's right in their own eyes. So what do you expect them to do, right? And so anyway, so in that mist of darkness, all right, I, I took you to a low point, right? Remember I was at a high point with Hannah, and I took you to a low point. So if you're at a low point, what's the only way, what's the only way to go if you're at the most lowest point? Your only way is up. So that's exactly what you see. The only way is up. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child wearing a linen ephod. In other words, although they were sinning, although Israel was messed up, God was already in the background preparing someone to deliver Israel to be right with God. You see? So I want us to understand this principle because this is the principle that we will apply to everything in our lives. Everything, anything. That when things are going bad, you say, okay, it might be going bad, but you know what? The Lord is preparing something and things are going to get better. I don't know when, but it will get better. And when things get better, what do you say to yourself? I got to be careful because I know there's going to come a time when things are going to go back down and it's going to be very bad. So the, the, the thing is with people is that we kind of we tend to, to, to let the circumstances dominate our thinking, right? So as soon as things are bad because of man, man, life, life bites, man. I don't like my life. But when things are good and we think that nothing bad can happen to us, that's like very dangerous too. So we allow circumstances to control our mind. And God is showing us we don't do that stuff because things go up and down, right? So anyway, um, now let me go show you the things that they were doing. They were even far worse than taking out the meat from, from the bronze altar. Look what they did here in verse 22. Now Eli was very old. And he heard everything his sons did to all Israel and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Check that out. In front of the tabernacle, they were doing that with women, guys. That's what they were doing. And so it is only fitting that God's wrath, his holy wrath, is going to come upon the priesthood. There's nothing else to do from here. They, they, they don't know the Lord. I mean, you're crazy. If you think that, you know, God... Is not going to punish you for doing something like that? You're crazy. You don't know God. You don't know how much he hates sin. And so Eli says to them, uh, <clears throat> oh, well, anyway, this is what God says. He's going to now judge Eli and his sons. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, thus says the Lord, did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in G Egypt in Pharaoh's house? house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? So why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? In other words, why didn't you punish your kids? Why didn't you correct them? And if the law says that they have to be killed for their disobedience, why didn't you follow the law? So you're going to find out that this principle is going to be carried over to Jesus, right? What does Jesus say? If you love your father or mother, if you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And so when you look at Eli right here, he wasn't worthy to be a priest. And so now what's going to happen is that he's going to get judged. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons on Hophni and Phinehas, and one day they shall die, both of them. And so you get this tragic news that Eli and his sons are going to be wiped out and they would never serve. His family would never serve under the priesthood. And so uh, um, as an application, you know, God will judge sin. You know, just because we're saved, we cannot get away with sin. You, you look in the, when you look in the book of Revelation, what do you see? Jesus' arms look like bronze. And he starts judging the churches and he calls them to repent. And so I'm not trying to tell this to you that, oh, man, you guys are going to lose your salvation because God never goes back on his promise. He never does. But I am saying, though, that um, he will punish us for our sin. And so we cannot take it lightly. And he did this to Eli. So anyway, um, so it was dark again, right? 
So what's the only way? Uh, what's the only way? The only way is up. And so this is what you see again. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, Samuel would make these prophecies, and they would all come true. And now everyone is starting to respect the Lord. They're starting to want to hear God's word. And the word of Samuel came to all of Israel. He started preaching the word of God to them again. And so you would think that the preaching of the word would cause them to repent, right? No, they didn't repent. Have you ever seen that before? Where, some, where you would actually preach the gospel to someone and you would hope that they would change, but then they don't? So just because you preach it, just because he's doing the right thing, doesn't mean they're going to repent. There's going to come a time when they are going to repent, but it's not that time. And because they're not repenting, God must judge them. So in verse 4, Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and camped beside Ebenezer and the Philistines and camped in Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. So that's God's way of telling Israel, I am not with you. He allows them to be defeated in battle. So what do you think they should do after they're defeated in battle? What, what's the first step that they should do? I'm sorry? Pray. Thank you. So, such a logical person, right? Pray. Why? Because remember, that's exactly what Joshua did, right? When he lost an AI. He was like, Lord, why did you allow this to happen? He asked. But you know what they did? They didn't pray. And this is what they did. Let me show you what they did. When the people had come to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us. And when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. So they think that because they remembered how the Ark um, helped them cross, you know, how the Ark, you know, pushed the Jordan River and gave them victory, that they were going to go bring this Ark and God was going to be with them. You know, they think that by bringing the Ark, even if they worship Baal, and all the asterisks and all those guys, that by bringing the ark, God's going to make it good. No, that's not what's going to happen, right? But the thing about it was, the Philistines realized how powerful that ark was. They know the history of Israel. It's like, hey, hold on. We know this. When this comes out, they win, you know, because their God fights for them. But you know what? We got no other option, guys. We got to fight. There's no way, there's no way we, um, we just got to fight them, even if the ark is there. And so the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Also the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. So they all both died, because that was God's judgment. He was judging Israel, and he was judging the priesthood. Now, why did God allow the Philistines to take the ark? Well, you're going to see that he's going to be judging them for their sin too. But I want to show you why, the, why God wanted to kick out the Philistines in the first place. Okay, I'm going to show you that. Well, but for now, what I want you to understand is the message that he was giving to Israel. He says, well, they know that the ark is representative of God's presence, right? He says, you guys are so sinful that I'd rather live with the Gentiles instead of you. That's basically what he's saying. You see that? Because we know God is all-powerful. He doesn't have to be captured by them. But he's basically saying that to them. You guys are so sinful that I'd rather live with the Philistines. That's pretty bad, right? So anyway, um, the Philistines, and I don't know what, I know they're touching the ark. They're not supposed to touch the ark, but they're touching it. And they put this ark beside Dagon. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. And when the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Uh, house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. In other words, they're saying that all religions lead to the same place. They put God in step with Dagon. It doesn't matter who you worship. That's the God of Israel. It's okay. We worship the God of Dagon. It's the same thing. All of us are worshiping God, right? And so that's how they were thinking. And so God is going to teach them a lesson. And he does it very gently, guys, because he knows they're Philistines. They have no clue about what the Bible is. So what does he do? When the people of Ashdod rose early in the morning, there was Dagon falling on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. Sometimes I think this is funny, but I also think it's serious too. 
God creates a miracle where the statue just bows down before the ark. That's God's first hit. Hey, I am God above all gods. You don't worship Dagon. Dagon worships me. And so you guys got to worship me. That's what God was telling them. But the Philistines didn't see it like that. They did it. That's the crazy thing. Uh, you want to know why they didn't see it? Because they're spiritually blind. That's why they didn't see it. And when you're spiritually blind, no matter how many miracles come up in your face, you won't see it. So they put it up, right? So God gives them a stronger miracle. You know what he does? It says it right here. And when they rose early in the morning, there was Dagon falling on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off and on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. So I don't know where his head was and I don't know where his arms was, but there was just only a stump. It's basically, basically saying your Dagon is just a piece of stump, man. He's nothing. But I want you to, I want you to kind of like go into your imagination. You guys seen those really scary movies of paranormal activity, right? You know, all that ghost stuff? This should freak you out. This is paranormal activity to the max, man. You, see, you one day go into like your room, in the room, you put the statue here, you go in there, and now the arms are broken and the head is broken. That is scary stuff. And I don't know why they weren't scared. They thought it was a coincidence. And so I want you to see why God had to take out the Philistines. Because no matter how much he tries to talk to them, they continue to work in their own ways. They continue to stay in their idolatry. God tells them um, all the time. He reveals himself to them in things like this. But they won't see it. So what do you see in the book of Romans? What does it say in the book of Romans? Romans 1, chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. And for God has shown it to them. And so you see in a very picturesque way that the Philistines are kind of acting like what we do today. God is doing great things in their lives, probably saving them from accidents and stuff like that. And yet they kind of just say it was just a coincidence. You see? So anyway, um, they still thought it was coincidence, so God took it a lot further. He was going to judge them because his wrath is still kindled on the Philistines. He says, but the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. In other words, he gave them what we call the bubonic plague, and I'll, I'll share you why scholars think it was a bubonic plague. But where the ark was, people got sick. People got sick. And, and they thought like, hey, you know what? Maybe this is just a coincidence, so we're going to send it to Gath, to another city. And you know what happens there? I'm going to go ahead and speed it up. The people of Gath get sick, and they start getting tumors too. And so you're thinking, man, God is giving you some signs here. you got to understand, when God does this stuff, it isn't because he's trying to like tell you how bad you are, although that's part of it. But the main purpose is he's trying to get these Philistines to repent, to say, hey, man, God, you're, you're a great God. Okay, you made me sick. God, please heal me. Remember one, one time when, um, when God caused the snakes to bite the people in Israel, right? They didn't say, hey, get away from God because he didn't kill us with more snakes. They said, oh, God, forgive us for our sin and heal us, right? That's what he says. And so in here, they're moving this ark around, thinking it's coincidence, and people start getting sick. So they said, hey, man, uh, let's, put the, let's put this, uh, this, uh, this ark and put it into a different city, right? And so the people of Ekron were like, no, they're trying to kill us, man. Get that ark away from us. And so I want you to see that reaction, guys. Let me put it this way. No, don't bring God in here. Get him away from us. He's going to kill us. Get him away from us. That's how they looked at God. And so now you understand why God had to let Israel conquer them. Because no matter what God showed them, they just would not repent. They rather worship their Dagon and stay in their sin, right, instead of worship the one true God. And so anyway, um, they're realizing that, you know, this ark is giving them trouble, and now they want nothing to do with God. So you know what they do? Instead of asking forgiveness from God, they say, just give them back to Israel. Send them away. We don't want God in our lives. Every time God is in our lives, all he does is cause me trouble, you know, 
but they don't understand that when God does that, he's trying to get our attention. You know what I'm talking about? Remember, suffering is a blessing from God. It teaches us to go to him. This is the same principle, right? The same principle, but they reacted differently. They said, I don't want to suffer like that. Push him away. Push him away. Get him out of here, right? And so they, uh, I'm going to go ahead and speed things up a bit. Um, hopefully you guys did the reading here. But they, were, they, they consulted their priest, and they said, okay, so we got to give out a trespass offering. So how do we give a trespass offering? They have no clue because they don't, know, they don't read the Bible. So their trespass offering is, I'm going to give God five golden mice, five golden rats, and five golden tumors. And that's the trespass offering. And you guys know that's not how you come to God, but yet God kind of understands that that's how they understand it, right? Besides, he knows that they want nothing to do with him. They're sending him away. So he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't punish them. But that's why, they, that's why scholars say it was the bubonic plague, because they made, they made rats and tumors. And the bubonic plague um, does that. You remember the song, Ring Around the Rosy? That's the bubonic plague. Ring around the rosy, pocket, pocket full of posies, a po pocket full of posies, ashes to ashes, we all fall down. That's really like a very uh, happy way of saying something very sad. But that's where it comes from. Anyway, that's a side point. But I'm going to go back to the main point. So they do this, right? And they still don't think it's God. So you know what they do? They're going to put two mommy cows on here and put their little baby cow away. Now let me ask you this. What do you think happens when you take a mom away for her kid? What do you think happens? They're going to go crazy, right? They're going to go back to, hey, man, bring me back to my kid. So they wanted to see that if it was really God causing this, that they would put these cows on there and that they would run back and they'll know that it has nothing to do with the ark. They're, they're just that hard-headed. That's what spiritual blindness does, guys. There is hard-headedness. Um, let me share with, uh, a story with you um, that uh, there comes a time, and I know this sounds scary, but there comes a time of repentance. And when the gospel is given to you, and you, if, you, if the gospel is given to someone, and they don't come at that time of repentance, we don't know if that time of repentance will come again. Um, do you guys remember Adrian Rogers? I've shared this story with you probably, but I'm gonna share it, I'm gonna share it again. Adrian Rogers was preaching, and over at the balcony, he saw that this person was being affected by a sermon. And he was preaching and, and calling for this person to come to the altar. He was giving an altar call. And so this young guy comes down, but he never comes to the altar. And so anyway, fast forward in life, um, several months later, the same pastor sees the same guy in the hospital. And he says, hey, weren't you at my church? And wasn't I giving the altar call? I saw you get up. It's like, yeah, I did get up. I, I was at your church, and I heard your sermon. Yeah, but then after that, I didn't see you again. Why didn't you come up? Well, I realized that when I was coming down that I would have to let go of my favorite sin. And I was, as I was going down those steps, I realized I'd rather have my favorite sin. So I walked out the church. And so the, guy, the pastor says, well, you know what? Um, well, you can't enjoy your fa favorite sin now. You're on your deathbed. So you might as well accept Christ now and, and be saved. And you know what he said? No, I don't want anything to do with Christ. You see what I'm saying? So there comes a time of hardening, right? There comes a time of hardening where when Christ comes with the gospel and, and you just keep saying no, there's, you don't know if you're going to be able to accept the next time around. And so this is what's happening with the Philistines. I'm showing you this right now. They've been hard to the point that now they're sending God away, and, and, and now he's going to show them a miracle, and they still don't repent. So anyway, they put these cows on there, right, expecting that the cows would run back to their kids, but no, the cows almost like had this GPS, and they know exactly where to go. They started walking towards Israel. So now um, they walk towards Israel. Israel receives the ark right? They, they take the cows and they sacrifice them to the Lord, but then they didn't know the God, God's word. And you'll see that although the Philistines touch the ark, God's not going to make the same exceptions with Israel. Like, they're expected to know not to do that stuff. It says here, um, and I'm going to show it to you. Well, here it is. So, because the people in Kirjath of Beth Shemesh did not respect the, the, um, the word of God in handling the ark. 
50,000 of them died, man. 50,000 of them died. He was judging them because they haven't truly repented yet because they weren't coming back to God's word. And so, um, but the, the different thing about them was that they didn't say, oh, like, throw, give back the ark to the Philistines because God's going to kill us. They didn't, they didn't see it that way. They took it to a different city because they wanted to know how to appease their God. They were thinking about how they could make it right with him. But, but it seemed like God wasn't having any of it. So you know how long when they moved it to Kirath, Jiriab, to, oh no, when they moved it to Beth Shemesh, to Kirath, Jiriab, you know how long it took for them to really repent? It said over here. So it was the ark that remained in Kirjath Jiriam a long time. It was there 20 years. 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. You see that? See, that's what it was supposed to do. Death isn't supposed to push the ark away. Death is to say, oh, Lord, we messed up and we're sorry. We're, they're lamenting. They know that they messed up. And so now they're seeking after God, right? Remember how Hannah was barren? And she seeked after God. It's the same principle. So now they're seeking after God. And so this is what I want to mention, that when God does that to our life. Yeah, when we're in sin, he punishes us hard, but it's not so that he pushes us away. It's to create what we call godly sorrow so that we can go to God. And when we have godly sorrow, that's the kind of heart that he wants to use for his kingdom, to further his will. It says, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. What's the sorrow of the world? The sorrow of the world is the Philistines were sorry that they took the ark. That's the sorrow of the world. Okay? The sorrow of godly sorrow is to say, I really offended the ark. I really offended God. And I want to make it right. And so Samuel starts to lead them to make it right. Then Samuel spoke to the house of Israel saying, If you return, if you repent to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the asherahs from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the asherahs and serve the Lord only. So remember in the book of Judges, I gave you the cycle. Remember that little circle I gave you, right? So now they're going up to the good cycle because now Samuel is the good judge, right? He's leading them. Samuel is going to be the last judge of out of all this, okay? So he leads them. And so, um, just to make a, a, a long story, well, I'm going to go ahead and quicken this up um, because it's almost 12 o'clock. Um, so what happens is that the Philistines get into battle with them, and they say, Samuel, don't stop praying for us. So Samuel keeps crying out to the Lord, and the Lord thunders from the sky. And boom! And the Philistines get rattled. And after that, Israel goes to war, and they defeat the Philistines. Because they repented to the Lord. It's not because they were victorious in battle. Remember, we just learned from previous history that they could not beat the Philistines. That's how the ark was stolen in the first place. But because they repented from God, God gave them that time of refreshing. And now they experience victory from God. And so, basically, what I showed you is God's holy wrath. Not only to Israel, but to the Gentiles. And I also showed you how you appease his wrath. And the way you appease his wrath is not to push him away. It's to come to him in repentance, right? It's to come to him in repentance. And so anyway, um, let me go ahead and conclude this now. Um, let me go ahead and give you guys your truth rhyme. Hold on a second. So that you guys can tie everything together here. I forgot to copy it over. Okay. So go ahead and... Oh, man. Here it is. Okay, so here's your truth rhyme. When we sin, his wrath is sent. God's love begins when we repent. Okay, and so now, um, let me go make an altar call, can? All right. And so now this is to the audience, okay? to the audience. Now, maybe for those that are listening online have realized that you've offended God. 
that all the suffering that you've been going through was God's way to tell you that you need to come back to him. Maybe at that time you were kind of just pushing it away, saying that it was a coincidence and you would continue to live your life the way you wanted it. But now God continues to keep you, he continues to make you suffer and you want it to stop. Well, that's God's way of telling you to come back. He doesn't let you suffer as a prodigal son um, just because of, of your own decision. He allows that suffering. He allows your disobedience to bring about obedience. So now God is calling you to obey. Are you ready to obey? Because if you are, then this is a scripture that you need to know. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so when I say repent, that means you turn from your sin, that you stop doing what you're doing, just as what you saw in Israel. They put away all those, those idols. They no longer depended them for happiness, and now God is going to provide you joy. And so if you are willing to do that, if you're willing to allow the Bible to be the sole rule of your life to dictate to you what good and evil is, then you are on the right track. You are ready to repent. But that doesn't save you. The attitude of repentance doesn't save you. But this will. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so if you want to be saved, if you want to experience everlasting life, you have to put your faith in Jesus. You have to believe in him. What does it mean to believe in him? It's to believe that Jesus is God, that he came to be a man and died for your sins, died for your sins and rose again from rose again from the rose again on the third day. And so if you believe that Jesus did that for you, you are saved immediately. And if you want to be saved, you can follow along with me in this prayer. Just repeat after me. Just repeat after me. Just follow along with me. Just yeah, just follow along with me. Dear Jesus, I know I am a sinner but I know I need a savior. I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for my selfishness and only living a life for myself. Please forgive me. I turn from what I used to do and now I run to you. I want you to be the king of my heart. Let the Bible teach me what's wrong and what's right. Let the Bible teach me how to live a righteous life. I accept you as my Messiah. I believe Jesus is God. I believe he died on the cross for my sins, and I believe he rose from the dead on the third day. I believe. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And so if you prayed that prayer, you have crossed from death into life, and if you are online and need more material to, draw, to get closer to God, to uh, help you in your walk with God, go ahead to faithlb.org, scroll all the way down, click contact, and I will send you some material on how you can grow your relationship with God. But for the rest of Faith Baptist Fellowship, I call on you to stand for our final song.
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. 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 All right, good afternoon, faithful.